describing the, the stages as, as if it's a sort of unitary disease that progresses in a straight line is really hard. People will have different symptoms or have the same symptoms but with a slightly different emphasis. Um, and so this is very much a first draft and what I'd really appreciate is your feedback, um, both on whether at the stage you, you and your partners or um, family may be at um, but all, and the experience you've had thus far um, but also there will be of course, some people in the room who have either been through the whole journey of PCA or further than, further than others. Um, the reason I'm not giving this as a handout at this stage is what would be great would be if I essentially read through what I've written get your comments both as we go through and at the end about whether it sort of seems to ring true for the experiences you've had um, and then if we could have a brief conversation about what's missing from this, what hasn't been captured, are there people for whom this is entirely in the wrong order or is there at least some, some common element of truth for all of your different stories that this captures that and might make this a helpful thing for new people who get a diagnosis um, to tell them about what, what may be lying ahead of them. Um, I've also been very careful at this stage not to talk about time. So I've just tried to describe what the different stages might look like. But of course in different people there may be bigger or longer gap, uh, longer or shorter gaps in between the occurrence of these different stages. So again, your, your input on uh, your experiences of how fast these things progress would be really helpful. The final caveat is that um, this describes a kind of common course, a sort of gradual progression um, towards the end of life. But I know that for a lot of people, things uh, they have periods where very little seems to change, and then other times where things seem to change very, very rapidly. And I've spoken to several people in the room already about how their um, partners or um, husbands or wives or mothers or fathers have had <coughs> problems which they couldn't possibly have anticipated three, six, eight months ago. Um, and so I'm aware that there may be diversions from this course, big important diversions which lead to a change in um, the type of care someone needs or the, the, uh, where, where they might be um, living that might lead in some cases to them being sectioned under the Mental Health Act because things have changed so fast or because aggression has become involved. Um, which might not be the case for everybody, but are really important to try and capture. So my guess is that this, what I would like to see is um, that we have a conversation, then I try and revise this and make it a bit better, send it out to you for your further comments after I've also spoken to other colleagues um, here at the DRC, nursing colleagues, neurologists, psychologists, to see that we can try and get something that most fits most people's impression of what this, what this syndrome looks like um, over time. Uh, that said, <laughs> caveat, 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 <laughs> uh, if I just read through this, as I say, please do feel free to chip in at, at the end of each stage, um, but there may be more general um, comments about the sort of framework, about whether this has captured anything useful at the end, and please don't, there's no need to be polite, if this doesn't capture your experiences, it's much better for me to hear it now than after we publish something and then other people find it really unhelpful. And, and the group you're sending it to yes. is the group of carers just for the minutes, that's all. Yeah. Uh, I think the easiest thing would be to send it, yes, to send it to the carers here who've been part of the conversation and then, and then um, to, to send it out more widely. If it's, I just don't want to release something too quickly um, for someone who hasn't been at this meeting to pick it up and to, to think, right, this is gospel, this is exactly what's going to happen to us, and then get <laughs> two, three months down the line and say, well, hang on, I'm only at stage two and I've already gone off course, or it already doesn't match up with what I'm experiencing. Um, so this is just a suggestion. Richard. In the room here are, are all those carers? And the majority, yes. Majority. Okay, so the way I've tried to do this, and I say uh, it's the first draft, is there's something uh, by uh, a doctor called Barry Reisberg who has tried to define what he calls the seven stages of Alzheimer's, typical Alzheimer's disease, so typical memory led Alzheimer's disease. Some of you may have read it, seen it on the internet. And so I thought that the easiest starting point, <coughs> rather than starting completely from scratch, would be to take what he's written and try and translate it for PCA. And so what I'm going to try and show you is my translation into PCA experience language syndrome of what he would describe as the different levels of severity um, of, of that typical Alzheimer's disease and what that looks like. Um, 
I'll just read through, I think, is the easiest thing, but, but please do feel free to be at any, at any stage. So, obviously, we've all started uh, at the stage of no impairments. There's normal function, um, and for everybody, this would look the same. So, the person does not experience any memory or visual problems, um, and an inter interview with them, uh, with a medical professional, doesn't show any kind of evidence of symptoms. So, clearly, we all start in this place. There is a comment on that one. Isn't yeah. It? It's almost clear that there's no evidence. Because I think looking back, yeah. you might say, oh yeah, I can see now that it started before there was... Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's what I've tried to capture in the next stage. Um, so this is the stage of what, we, what he has tried to describe as very mild cognitive decline. So I think this is possibly the stage you're referring to, Richard, where things are subtly beginning to go wrong, but other people perhaps don't see it, a doctor wouldn't see it, but this person, maybe, maybe only the person themselves, or maybe only the nearest and dearest, would notice that something isn't just quite right. And they can't necessarily put their finger on what it is or describe it clearly, um, but there's a sense that something isn't quite right. So I think rather than me reading it out loud, I'll leave you to read it. But if you perhaps. Yes, please do. I, that just says certainly using the computer, but my husband's very first. Writing. Okay. That was how. Yeah. yeah. That was my mum's as well. Writing. Writing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I started writing yeah. and speech. So my husband, what he thought was stuttering, wasn't actually stuttering. Yeah. So experience of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Speech. Yeah. Speech wasn't. Okay. I had. He used to be able to use the telephone and all that, but when somebody gave him the number and he was having to write it down, he couldn't read it back. Yeah. So very specific instances of subtle difficulty. It might not yeah. be all the time, or it might be just numbers, not words. Well, I think you can't some, predict some. the numbers. Yeah. Whereas you can the words. Exactly. So it's probably covering up the words. Yeah. The other thing that I think we, uh, Mum noticed was that he was having trouble with into a room and not remember why she'd got there. Now that might just be about that as you get on. <laughs> 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 but she said it seemed to be more noticeable. <laughs> 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 and are those two last words that you said that you were very impressed with? Yeah. Yeah. How is this different from somebody who's just getting old? Yeah. Because you can be fogged off with that. Absolutely, but this, I think this is, I think the reason he included this stage is to is to recognise and make note of the fact that there are so many people who go through a period at which it's not sure, you're not sure if you're just getting old or if it's yeah. perfectly normal or if it is the natural experience of walking into a room, which I've certainly done a lot, um, and not knowing why you're there, or if there's something more sinister going on. And it's recognising that, because sometimes people, sometimes people describe the clinical treatment they've had in the earlier stages as being awful because so-and-so didn't pick up on something. And there are undoubtedly cases in which they should have picked up on things, but sometimes the first reports or the first descriptions are, we ourselves aren't sure if something's gone wrong or not. We just know that we don't feel quite right, and there are a million different reasons why that could be the case. And unfortunately, often, particularly in PCA, people are told the other reasons rather than PCA, so you're told it's the menopause, or you're depressed, or you're anxious, and you're more likely to be told those other non-PTA reasons than, than the actual cause. And that's one of the reasons for acknowledging that this is a difficult, early, um, and sort of cloudy first stage at which things are not quite right, but not in, not in a clear enough <coughs> way sometimes for anybody to put their finger on it. Um, I think one other thing, because I think it is uh, different, it's vertigo. Um, yeah. Farrell's problem, so that's a really good one to put in. They know all we from what I understand. So she always had vertigo in some situations, yeah. but finding that she was having vertigo in other situations, and that uh, that led to the loss of confidence in driving. Yeah. So it wasn't that the loss of confidence was first was specifically because of it. So. so I think this is, again, it's a, a way of trying <coughs> to capture something relatively briefly, but also with enough detail, and so clearly a, a, a more, more extensive list of, of how these those first inklings might be would be helpful in this one. Thank you. So one of the other things, um, 
with my mum. My mum's left handed anyway, so she's always been pretty much like handed. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, but, um, so, well, it was um, car seats for children. Mm -hmm. You know, putting things together and then putting them into um, yeah. into the into the clip lock. Being able to put things together, just being able to put simple shapes together, put a lid on a teapot, those sorts of things. I don't know if that would come in here or if it comes in a bit later, but... Let's, let's pop on to the next one and, and see, but we can always flip back through these. So if you've got a comment and I've already stopped to the next one, please please do feel free to stop me. It's absolutely fine. We can nip back later on. So this is uh, the state today called mild cognitive decline, which um, they infer to mean that there's early stage um, Alzheimer's disease or PCA in this case can be diagnosed in some people but not in all. So again, the subtle the symptoms are clearer, but for some people they're still this. Uh, some people are still in the boat where they've had something not right for maybe a year, eighteen months at this stage. Seen a few people, but they're still not getting a clear diagnosis of what the cause is. So just take a minute to read some of those read some of those difficulties. about whether um, it is, is picking up, in, it's not listed, is it? So that would be, a, a, descript, that'd be a, a good description of something that you no, actually notice in everyday life. And probably I'd have my psychologist hat on and thought, oh, well, that would be a com might be a combination of difficulty locating and difficulty identifying. Um, but I think you, that's a really good point that we need to, that this needs to be, because it's meant to be for carers, this needs to be described in terms of what you would actually see in everyday life rather than what's, what might be the underlying process or mechanism which has gone on. Um, <coughs> working money out, change for the shop. Yeah. yeah. I think mean, that was, that was very early. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah. Um, finding things in a handbag, sheets where no mobile phone, no keys, no whatever. And that just continued. Yeah. I think the thing I find with Martin is he puts a £20 note out because he doesn't actually know how much he's spending. Yeah, and it's so easier to, to offer something and then get changed yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ah. sorry. I, mean, I think um, I understand what you mean by the mild memory problems, but I think um, my experience is it wasn't always connected to memory, mm -hmm. so, but to do with sort of, um, if you like, the athleticism of the brain, so learning new tasks. Yeah. Um, I, I understand that that's part of that bullet point, but it's not clear there. So at yeah. this stage, Mum couldn't um, learn something new, so it's like a recent event thing. Yeah. Um, it wasn't clear from that brain. So, uh, so a clarification that that could be for different reasons. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really helpful. The, me the memory is one of the tricky ones because as we've talked about many times in this group, uh, PCA isn't just clearly isn't just one thing. And there are some people who I'm s uh, saying to someone earlier, there are some people I know who are still living at home 10 years after their first symptoms with very severe visual, severe visual problems, but really in terms of memory, able to discuss what's in the news, current events, what they did yesterday, what they did last week. And other people who five, three, maybe even two years in are already beginning to have a bit of difficulty recalling exactly the, the recent events or being slightly repetitive in conversation. Um, and we call both of those people PCA because vision is the main problem. But these are additional problems are kind of creeping in at, at, at different rates. And so, but I think clarifying that they can, it could be for one reason or it could be for another is, is a much better way of handling it rather than just saying it's in or it's out. Have these stages? It's one of the only things that I noticed was very difficult to do it yourself and make these and he replaced the garden gate and he didn't seem to be aware that all the bits of wood were at an angle, right. not straight. <laughs> so he, he put, put the screws in straight yeah. and he said, look, here it is. And I thought, this is very weird. Yeah. And there was another sort of visual thing with regards to when he was still able to do his own 
eating and drinking. I noticed that when he was having his toast for breakfast, he used to only seek half the toast, so only half of it got the marmalade or the <laughs> yeah. And then when he cut it in half, he didn't cut it in half, he cut it a third, two thirds, yeah. and he thought it was in half. Yeah, that's yeah. very helpful. Very strange. So it's sort of subtle spatial distortions, yeah. Mm. Um, I've, got I've got a couple more around. Um, my mother gets very fixated on a certain task or thing that has to happen. She also gets very flustered, and we noticed quite early on actually that was more of a signal for us than some of these other things around being able to um, like be able to calm down about to get com com completely stressed out by a situation and completely okay. overreacting. Okay. Uh, I don't know where that fits in any of this, but. That's one of the symptoms that we've noticed. Okay, so that's helpful. So that's sort of struggling, noticing that things are generally more difficult, but maybe not knowing exactly why, and that manifesting as anxiety, anxiety or being flustered. Anxiety is the word. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, my wife has been, been suggested she has some treatment for anxiety because that exaggerates mm -hmm. symptoms. Absolutely. And I think anybody. I think there'll be lots of people in the room who recognise that, that that's a real kind of vicious circle thing that you've got, something's not quite right therefore you've become more anxious in response to that but then that makes everything itself, the anxiety itself makes everything more difficult <coughs> The other thing is telling the time. I don't know where that fits in any yeah. of this but she, she, that was, what, that was yeah. the giveaway actually. Yeah. Uh, one I had was, and I didn't realise it was an issue at the time, it was that suddenly Virtually every meal we sat down at the table, he was knocking his glass over, mm -hmm. and, and which had never happened before, yeah. and that went on for quite a long time. And I just kept thinking, <laughs> you know, why are you so clumsy all of a sudden? That but links in a bit to sort of, kind of reaching yes. out and picking up yeah. things, absolutely. Before David lost the ability to pick up, he would pick up and then put the glass down horizontally. Yeah, and yeah. 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 Wine and yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe if it's for Kara, some sort of reference to clumsiness or, or something. Yeah. Or yeah. Or uh, oh, I'm, I'm for somebody who has, hasn't previously ever been clumsy and yeah. aware, yeah. sort of clum clumsiness, yeah. that might be quite an easy way of... Absolutely, that's a really good sort of general... Yeah. It, it, and it's exactly, this is great, because it's exa exactly that kind of um, word that kind of captures a whole bunch of yeah. things, and loads of people, even if one person's experience of been putting glass down sideways and someone else has been knocking something over, words like that, like clumsiness in that, in a sort of in that context of being someone who was clumsy before can capture something more general. So even if we don't have everybody's individual um, situation listed, words that can speak to or hint at things that might resonate with people who are experiencing those sorts of situations is great. If I move on uh, to stage four, um, I've written, I'm aware with all these things, I would never, this is the sort of cardinal sin of any kind of presentation is to fill a slide with text. I promise you I would never normally do it. The only reason I just wanted to save 40 printouts of, of five pages of paper um, to put on each chair. So that's the only reason there's so much verbiage here. Um, have a few moments to have a look through this one. see that the, the sort of primary difference here is about the amount of help someone needs. Mm -hmm. So it's the distinction from the previous one. So the, in stage two it was something's wrong but I can't put my finger on it. Stage three is everyone accepts something's wrong. And it's not wrong all the time but there are specific <coughs> things that I can't do. Accents I make or can't do that I experience. Stage four is very much I, this is now seriously debilitating and perhaps I couldn't be left for a long period of time at home to look after myself because I wouldn't, for the various reasons we've talked about, be able to cook for myself, find food, 
or be able to do many of the other sort of daily activities that we would normally be used to doing. That's the sort of general framework I think that they were driving at here. Problem sitting down on chair. Problem sitting down on chair. Sort of difficulty locating where it is, sitting on the arm or missing it. And, yeah. I think that's a really important one because it relates so directly to the um, mo the criteria for things like mobilisation for, for care and stuff. Because that's a really good point. Somebody's got no problem actually mobilising physically, yep. but they have a problem because they're going to miss the chair completely, not because of a lack of muscle. So yeah. I think that because we're mobilised, we can't demobilise. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. That, that might be quite a useful one to have at that, that point because that's so fundamental. In that's really helpful. Yeah. It's interesting to start as corporate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would have put that down as sort of a bit more than one. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. See the rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, and I, I think the word the wording is is taken directly from the other um, from the other stages, the labels of the seven stages of Alzheimer's disease, and it may be that you're absolutely right and that we need to keep the word moderate but shift some of these things down or shift some things up. Um, and it would be interesting that maybe even be one of the things that we could do when we send it out to this group is people could simply put arrows mm -hmm. saying, oh, I would say we experienced this really early and this was much later or we haven't experienced it yet. My wife can't read at all. Okay. And has difficulty seeing things, but she appears to be able to see television. Okay. Mm. Yep. Oh, that's perfectly well. Yep. Yeah. My brother's exactly the same. He goes to the cinema, mm -hmm. moving image plus sound, he remembers it. Yep. Weeks afterwards, he can tell you down to the nth degree what that film was about. It's yep. Exactly the same time. Yep. But cannot <laughs> read anymore. Mm -hmm. We realise that it's something to do with the movement and the sound. Yeah. So it's what we now do is if we're asking him to follow us through a complicated foyer or something like that, yeah. we actually make a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. We actually almost wrap our arms yeah. and we're going here. Um, because for some unknown reason, the combination yeah. It, it works for his visual and cognitive. We, and in, when Tim and Kirsty and I are doing psych, the psych, routine psychology tests that we do with lots of the people who kindly help with research, we often have to orient people using using motion mm -hmm. to see, because you might put down a, down a book in front of someone, I'm sure you all know this, and you say, well, I'd like you to look at this picture now, and there'll be yeah. bits of this going on, and you say, if you just follow my thing, oh yes, yes, and then suddenly you can focus in on a tiny, de you know, real yeah. precise detail sometimes, um, but only only once it's been found, so I think that rings true for a lot of people. I think the other, the other thing is that, you know, this comes to the overall thing, but I know that my perception of the stages of this has changed fundamentally as we made this journey. Mm. So what we I thought was really severe <laughs> eight years ago is now very different to yep. what I think is very severe. So I yep. think that something in advance of these stages of saying, you know, this is a journey and you don't I mean it's gonna be hopefully easier for people once you once we've got these descriptions which we, we didn't have but that sense of without in any way belittling the difficulties that you've got at one stage, it yep. does the perception will change. And the language around that I think is is important and, and also tricky because I think you want to, as you say, not for a moment belittle <laughs> the, the challenge of dealing with those early problems but equally not terrify people by what's to yeah. come. And yes. we, we've all experienced that, you know, physically with sometimes for some people with this group of not wanting, or some people didn't want to come to the group initially and then after a couple of years actually decided it would be something that they felt able to come to or might make use of. And so we all respond to these. Other people, you know, get a diagnosis and just, you know, bring it on with the information and just seem to be able to take on board a huge amount. And I think that's that's a that's a real trick um, that we need to try and solve, or a dilemma we need to solve as to how to word this. Mm -hmm. yeah, not to select the pointer option. Oh. <laughs> oh, hello. Over here. So thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I get a question then? Please. Uh, point. I think some of the words that you've used to sort of, uh, as a different description of these stages would be useful to put in. I know it's more words. But you, know, you remember what you were saying. 
about this one and the previous one. Yeah. Another another sort of another way of looking at it. So it's sort of a more of an overview thing rather than a specific yeah. detail of these. Yeah. Thank you. And that, that maybe could be tied in with what you're saying about how, how we describe how we describe what we call moderate mm. will change depending on where you are with the disease. Mm. So, yeah. Whilst the uh, procedure is divided into various stages, surely the process is very gradual. So the stages such as quite arbitrary, isn't it? So, so the definition of stages is arbitrary? Yes. Uh, does it help in the treatment to divide into stages? Because so the reason for doing this is one of the most frequently asked and badly answered questions <coughs> in any clinic is what stage am I at? What's going to happen next? And I agree with you entirely that the definition of any stage is entirely arbitrary, just as, you know, to some extent, lots of degree d disease labels are arbitrary. They're just, you know, they're helpful classifying words that help us to say, okay, like we're talking about this type of person and not this type of person. So there is no quantum leap from one stage to another. It's a very really gradual process. And, and for some people, they may stay, stay in one stage for, stage for a long time and then progress through the next three in a year. And, and that's, the diff that's the challenge of, of answering that question. And the reason for exploring whether something like this can be written in a helpful way, or is possible even, is an attempt to try and answer that, that frequent question of what stage am I, what will happen next? Because um, the alternative is just to say, everybody's different, can't help you. Um, <laughs> and I, f I feel there should be some, some middle ground which mm -hmm. says this isn't necessarily exactly what will happen to you but this is other people's experience so I think I could, what I was hoping some people might be interested in doing would be oops, to provide a sort of commentary if you like from their personal perspective on whether this rings true for them because <coughs> we'll never possibly describe the course of the syndrome in a way that everyone agrees with because yeah. everyone's experience is different and so ha if we could have a range of opinions of yes this is quite like what happened to me um, and someone else who says this is very like what's happened to me for us it was two years someone else says well for, for us it was 12 years then I think that at least gives people who are new to this who've just got a diagnosis some sense of the, the boundaries the range of possibilities of what might happen so that whatever happens to them is not quite such a shock as it would have been if they'd had no information. And the treatments afforded, would they vary with each stage? Or? Yes. Yeah. So there is a sub yeah. change in treatments. Exactly. And it's, if we could establish some sort of common language for talking about what, roughly where we are within a course, not precisely, but roughly, then I think it would help <coughs> people to get a sense of, um, you know, if I said, okay, Ibixa as a medication tends to be a sort of thing that you might start thinking about at about okay. stage five. Even if you don't know what Ibixa is at that point, then you can look. You can look at this and say, okay, we're definitely not there yet. Yes, my wife just been uh, diagnosed earlier this year, and I'm ticking all but two of those boxes. Right, absolutely small. Absolutely. So that's so that raises another another obvious challenge is that different people will receive diagnoses at very different stages. Some people, because of their situation, <coughs> medical care they receive, will get information about this at the very, very early stages, may still be working, just noticing really subtle changes. Other people may have had difficulties for, for on reflection for a little bit longer before they get told what their situation is. So not, not everybody starts at stage one. Indeed. I've seen uh, two and three, I was ticking those as well. And yep. Interesting to hear what comments are coming from, from, from others as well. Yeah. There's always those there. But uh, as I say, all I've got all but two of all the two of them. I wonder if it's worth coming in around the coping mechanisms that um, people with PCA have because my mum has an incredible memory because she can't write something down. Right. So her ability to I mean, she has this thing about this, everything has to come out, it's all verbal, it's like verbal diarrhea, but because she's got so much in her head, she can't, she, she's got to get it out somewhere for it someone, in order to be able for someone to do it or for herself to do it. Yeah. But there is, you know, it, the flip side of, of all of this decline is that there are other functions of her brain that have actually, have actually improved <coughs> because she's having to cope with some of it. So. Yeah. So people no, resorting to other skills or yeah, complementing their Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, it's not, it is doom and gloom, but it's not all doom and gloom because there are ways that people get, and obviously she's in the individual, others will have different problems. Okay. 
one of the things, and maybe it doesn't belong in this area, but it's the ability uh, for, I'm thinking of movement type things, or being able, like my husband used to at least go off to the Tesco, which is a block away, to buy his own lunch and deal with the money and stuff. And it's a combination of not only movement, but cognition. And um, I don't see that in here. Now, maybe that is somewhere else. But I think that's, you know, whether somebody can still do things independently. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on more than just their vision. It's yes. Yeah, to, to sort of be aware of the difficulty and think around, think yeah. around it. Absolutely. So that does come in on the next stage, I think, okay. from memory. Uh, but so. I was going to say, I really like um, the second sentence about pretending to a sense of purpose. Because uh, everybody that I've ever met with BCA has this um, strong sense of self, mm. even at this stage where they have to use their hands and, and yep. whatever. That's really good. Okay, thank you. Let's pop up the next one. Yeah. Just reading that back to myself already, there are a number of things which people have already mentioned um, as sort of being early early features, um, which have been left in, the current, in this current draft to this stage, but clearly would kick back in earlier. So we're talking things like um, feelings of imbalance or instability was one of the earliest things for gamer. Um, so that's something where we need to find some way of <laughs> reflecting that. The order of these things, or the, or the concentration mm -hmm. of that difficulty, may, may vary from person to person. Also, all of these are wrong. I mean, I'm too cool to go with at that stage, but I think with the headache and the other bit, um, he was always, um, I would say, had a very high pain control, mm -hmm. and now he has, he's very sensitive to pain. Right. So I don't know whether you'd say that was this stage or later, but definitely he seems to have an enhanced. Right, okay, thank you, that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. I know it's I know everyone's individual, but what about personality changes? Um, this is coming at some stage, because I mean, I noticed with my father, it's an extraordinary personality change. I don't whether that's just a corona with all these physical symptoms, and um, sort of his frustration is a bullet to that, but just little things like, he never used to be interested in talking to us in the food, and then when every time I ran up, he was delighted, and it's an constant change. Um, and, and things and then there some other things which were not so much personality, but he he never used to have sugar in his tea and he said, I have two sugars in my tea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the session of eating ice cream and pudding. Yeah. And things like that. It's just these personality changes. I don't know that's what's the So I'd say so I'd say they were they were common for they're not that common for PCA. Right. But that doesn't mean that doesn't sort of invalidate the label. I think it's about this this um, difference that the further you go into the condition, some people stay with this very very focal visual deficit, and for other people, the disease is spreading and it, um, more rapidly to other parts of the brain. So you're seeing this wider variety of features. Um, and I suppose so. It, I think that type of um, changes mentioned on the next stage, but I think it's really helpful and important to capture the fact that there are some people for whom that might be an early feature, um, because I think the difficulty, one of the difficulties is you never want to say this is PCA, because then if someone says something slightly different, then they, they're left then worrying, having the added anxiety, oh, we've got the wrong label, wrong diagnosis, and it depends a bit sometimes on how early you're diagnosed as to whether the clinician can appreciate exactly 
the f exact form you've got, but usually we just can't predict, and so things will develop at different rates and different people. Um, insight's another classic example. So um, this sort of preserved sense of self that we, or some preserved sense of purpose that we were just talking about, I think most people um, would, would say that that was a, a, a sort of typical feature of PCA, but I know of at least a couple of people who um, have been part of the group in the past who have had clear visual problems from the outset, but very little insight into them. And so you're, le you're left with this, well, if preserved insight and really bad vision are the defining symptoms of PCA, do they have it or not? <laughs> and I tend to veer on the side of, or the, the, the vision is the, is, the, is the prominent or preeminent symptom. Um, so I'd call them PCA, but their lack of insight is atypical. Um, and again, it's because we've got lots of concentric, uh, lots of uh, overlapping circles here, and we're trying to fit people into one quite broad category, and then assuming that despite the fact it's broad, there are lots of different people in it, that everyone's going to proceed the same way. So it's, it's a juggling act, but I think really helpful, as I say, maybe in a sort of case by case sort of anecdote style to say, Mr. Bloggs, who is a made up name, actually found that these changes occurred quite, quite soon after. Um, stage two or stage three or whatever. Um, the other thing that um, around this time, because there is something you can do about it, it's things like my chronic jerks, um, and I don't know how common they are in terms of it, 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 whether that's another example of, of it just being something that's actually fairly unusual on PCA, because it's something you can do something about. Yep. And by, again, it's quite marked by this stage. Um, it might be quite helpful. Uh, I think I, I hope it's in somewhere. But if, if I've left it to the next one, which I think maybe I have, then that I agree is maybe just one that needs to come. My mum, my mum has my chronic jerks, and she's actually I would say she's probably three to two. Okay, so that's maybe that's just something that needs to be promoted higher. As I say, this is me just at my computer going. Of the lots of people I've seen, when do I think roughly these things came in? So. Is my chronic jerks actually quite common? Yeah, very. Yeah. What Sorry, um, some people experience um, right, sudden okay. flick. It's often in the fingers. Uh, the most amusing, one of the first times I heard about it was a gentleman who used to be part of the group who, the first time he described it to me, he said the problem is he kept accidentally kicking his dog, so he sat in his arm. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly his leg <laughs> It's most, most, most commonly noticed in quite a subtle form of just little kind of flip jerky movements um, of, of the hands or arms. Uh, there are three, I think, three questions all along here. Um, my wife complains about feeling drops of water on her head inside. So I think that would go in with this sort of sensations in the scalp thing. I think a lot of people have, people describe it in different ways. And again, this is where the language is tricky. Um, but I think we need to try and capture these general terms that encapsulate the experiences like that. Some people experience it as drops of water, some people experience it or describe it as like there's a hand on the back of their head, some people just call it a kind of creeping sensation and can't put it into words or describe it in different ways. But um, just two examples that fit into those two things that I would have been glad to have seen listed from a safety point of view, because hmm. I remember the, the day I realised that my husband couldn't tell the difference between the curve and the road, okay. that mm -hmm. distinction, not just the physical because of the curve, but just the yep. difference, and um, on a, a, a narrow cliff path, suddenly realising that he didn't know the difference between being off the edge of the cliff and on the path. I can understand that quite a bit, why that would be a concern. Yeah. <laughs> but they do fit into those. Yep. Just to say, I find all of that slide that uh, fits with my life since then. But I would also agree with the personality changes. Mm -hmm. and in her case, they're very mild. Yeah. Actually, I have to kind of go along with that too, because my husband's definitely here. Personality changes, but from very early on, even before diagnosis, was lots of delusions that he probably has Lou Bob's also, mm -hmm. which probably is contributing a lot more to that, but yep. there's a lot of aggression and anxiety that comes out yep. of that that's been prevalent all the way through. Okay. So yeah. it's a little bit cloudy because that's sort of on the periphery of yep. some of the disease. The other thing I think is maybe 
more overarching, I don't know, but uh, my mum has a lot of um, infections, so uh, chest infections, colds, UTIs, those sorts of things. Right. Um, and we've noticed that she'll have a really nasty chest infection and she'll have it for two or three weeks, lots of antibiotics, and then we'll see a, a decline. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's something that's, it might be more overall, I don't know. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, debate at the moment about um, people often expect a degenerative disease to go in a straight line and then are understandably shocked when there suddenly seem to be these sudden drop-offs. And for a lot of a lot of people have always thought of those as being a bit like the difference between, um, so well, lots of people worry that that means that suddenly the disease is accelerated, the loss of brain cells has got faster or something. And the way doctors have tended to typically talk about that is to say, oh no, it's a bit like your, hard, uh, your computer crashing. You suddenly go from it working absolutely perfectly to not working. And it's not that the machine suddenly melted, it's physically exactly the same as it was, it's just the connection reached a tipping point and it's fallen over the edge. Reboot. Um, <laughs> Reboot and start again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but actually, what I was going to say was about infections, there's, some, there's a, a, quite a large drive in the research field to look at how those sorts of sudden accelerations or changes in people's progression might actually uh, relate to underlying infections. So we've all had the experience of having a cold or flu and your cognition is just not what it was. You can't think as clearly. You can't remember things. You, everything feels a bit slowed down. And whether some of the changes that we see sometimes in these progressive conditions are due to the interaction between something like Alzheimer's disease and underlying other underlying systemic illnesses, which maybe aren't manifested in quite a, in an overt way, but nonetheless the person's body is fighting something. Um, any other quick questions? It's it's very early in the year, signs of sign that's affected this way, and auditory and sense of touch and taste are they unaffected by Alzheimer's? Uh, so, no, we think they're all affected because they're all reflections of, they're all rely on different parts of the brain to be supported and fundamentally Alzheimer's disease or diseases like it puts pretty much remote, most regions of your brain at, at threat. So the attack is not on the visual cortex? So in PCA the, the primary focus is in the visual cortex to start with but we know it definitely um, pr proceeds to affect the auditory cortex for example so lots of people have difficulty not just seeing where things are but also hearing where things are so if you get someone with PCA to close their eyes and then you know jangle a bunch of keys they might not be able to look their sense of general sense of space irrespective of its sort of modality is impaired and that's why people often sort of surprised by things like they say oh, well even if you couldn't even if you couldn't see where the cupboard was that's got the plates in it why can't you remember where it is and it's because you or I if we just had a blindfold on have a, an intact sp spatial sense mm -hmm. so we can go okay I know I've been into my kitchen loads of times, I know the cupboard's over here, so I just walk around here. Um, if I reached out my hand like this, I'm sure I would sort of find the handle. And, and that space, more general sense of space, not just perceived space, but kind of internal representation of space, is, is degenerated in people with PCA as well. What do you think about universal something about proprioception? Because that's definitely yeah. the so sense of where, where you are in space, not yeah. just where other things are, but where your body is in space because that's, that's again quite marked and not knowing. It's not a question, am I the right way up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Which is comical, but actually yeah. it's, it's quite distressing, I think. Absolutely. So, um, and that's, I think there are some, there's some stuff earlier about sort of things like dressing problems, which are one manifestation of that, but again, we can make that more explicit, I think. But that's, am I the right way up is a really telling question. Uh, the other thing, I think it comes from that in the early stages is around being able to order things, as yeah. in order tasks. Yeah. So cooking a meal, for example, for, especially if there's a lot going on, since there's abstractions. Yeah. Um, and we spoke to someone and they said that because PCA kind of, when you're doing those times of tasks, PCA affects different parts of the brain as it's, as it's moving forward, those paths get upset. So actually being able to do those higher order functions are affected yeah. right from the start, and that's where you see the anxiety and the confusion and the getting muddled and things yeah. like that. Um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons that I didn't emphasise that in the early stages of, of, of writing this is there are some types of dementia where that's the primary problem. And, that, and that's the other sort of rub with some of these things is I don't want to, even though a full 
palliative problems may have been present for some people in the very earliest stages, there's a, there's a sense in which you need to go for what the, the general or most common pattern is because what you wouldn't equally wouldn't want is someone else with a different type of dementia to read this and think, oh, I've got PCA. Mm -hmm. And actually they've got a frontal problem because mm -hmm. which is where their main difficulty is ordering things. So I, I, I sort of completely agree with you. And it's again, it's the challenge of working out how we put that in. But thank you for raising it. Yes, about that. Um, I just want to say something about posture because mm -hmm. um, I think that's also a bit of a problem. Yeah. Um, Andy, who's my former partner, is the one that I'm the reason I'm involved with the PCA. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of, he doesn't just shuffle, but he's leaning to one side. Absolutely. And, and, and it's not very, very hard. Lots of nodding heads, and um, a lot of, I think this connects with this sense of proprioception, so knowing where your yeah, body is, yeah, exactly. so knowing that it's that way rather than that exactly. way. And he looks as though he's struggling quite a lot in the heart. Absolutely, and, and a lot of, and it relates to this balance. He looks about four or five inches shorter. Yeah. Thank you. That's really mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. I think uh, there's a lot of agreement about that, and I think it goes with this proprioception, thing, knowing where your body is, but also the sense of balance. And there have been a lot of people who described. Well, I remember one man in particular who, at the stage where he could still walk upright, said that when he was walking along the pavement, he felt like he was about to fall off the edge of the world. So he felt like he was tilted, yeah. even though he wasn't. Mm -hmm and other people who, as time has gone by, have actually started, as you say, walking at an angle. It makes it very difficult to support the, them the and to maintain their mobility. Um, again, the visual bit about if they see a floor, the cold hit the slow patterns, yep. a shiny surface, yep. it can be moving. Mm -hmm. And it must be like walking on one of those escalator things at an airport. And certainly on one occasion, I was walking along the corridor with Andy and he had my trousers on, but were flapping a bit around the ankles. And he said, look what I've got to do, I've got to... Well, and for him, that it was, was a really double, um, <laughs> double swirling um, effect. So, it must have been so, much. so we, we deal with that now, by he doesn't have trousers that flap around. <laughs> 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 um, but it's a risky There's a fear of falling into the um, just, I'm, I'm aware that time is passing. I don't actually know what the exact time is. I know that some people have got trains, so we've drifted on way more than we usually do, as always. Um, I'm going to just leave you to read this one just for a second, and there's just one more after that. as we get to these last couple of stages um, that a lot of the stuff here is very emotionally charged and very difficult, particularly for those of you who perhaps have you in the earliest stages of, um, of dealing with PCA. Um, does anybody have any comments on any of the things there? I mean, a lot of it we've sort of captured in things we've talked about already. And I guess in terms of the overarching plan here, one's imagining that at stages six and seven that there's more and more merger, if you like, with what the situation might be for people with other forms of other forms of dementia, like typical Alzheimer's disease. Not not exactly the same. Still, as I try to emphasise, this sort of visual thing mm -hmm. being predominant, but certainly a whole wide range of difficulties at this stage. Donna. Um, I think that's a really good point. I think that 
Christine at the moment gets completely obsessed with one particular thing. Right. Um, you know, absolutely focused on it, and the conversation is 100% that. Right. And, you know, and absolutely, it's like a screen in front of him, and, and you, you know, words come out, nothing will go back. Yeah. And, you know, he to, he's confirming the sound, not receiving. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, again, a bit like the personality change that we were talking about earlier, I think these are tend to be um, experiences or behaviours which we associate with more, and more, more frontal, more anterior damage and I think reflects this sort of spread of the condition of the disease to, to other areas of the brain but I think absolutely, I mean, even if, even if not everybody or most people don't experience that, that's not in any way to sort of devalue the diagnosis, I think it's just that the pattern of spread has been different. And, and also, his, really, I don't think his, his sight is that bad. Right. His hearing is appalling. Mm -hmm. And I think also it's an element of the fact that he's just not hearing. Yeah. Because not because of the hearing, because he's not able to absorb the, yeah. the messages. Yeah. But, the, but his eyesight, I don't think, is, is as bad as it could be. And it's this thing, it's this sort of unhelpful thing about the continuum. We know, you know there's PCA and there's typical AD, but there's a whole lot of stuff in between, which is probably sometimes called PCA and sometimes called typical AD. Uh, I know it's unhelpful, but it's it's a it's the sort of relative balance, and that's why people tend to, in in diagnosis, tend to stick on what the initial symptoms were, but things can change quite rapidly afterwards. This might be the stage that I put something in more um, uh, clearly about broader loss of sensory perception overall. Yep. So not yep. so something that says you know uh, touch, um, obviously vision anyway, but. Yeah. Sound and touching and whatever. That's a multimodal. So the, the thing of touching and then it's really painful or pain feeling gentle and mm -hmm. that kind of yeah. touching and you can see that kind of thing. I would put that slightly earlier. So confused sensation but then complete complete loss of sensation. Like so no not, sensation not just functionally blind, but se the sensation being difficult to interpret in any Not way. having yeah. any. Yeah. I mean, no, no, no sense of response to touch and things, mm -hmm. things like that. So, uh, that, that. Yep. Thank you. Steve, my husband, is going to have lots of hallucinations yep. with sun down in, I think they call it. Yep. Um, as the sun went down, he was thinking someone was coming to murder him, he'd right. scream out. Um, the floor and get quite aggressive. That's really helpful. So I guess that sort of, in part, is reflected in this these areas about sort of personality change and also the, the issue, sorry, the issue about sleeplessness um, or change in sleep pattern. Um, but I think that's something we can perhaps emphasise. Yeah. Just in the interest of some time, get to move on to just to the last stage. So just take a moment to. Um, read this. Sores if they're lying lying for too long, or cracks in the skin if they're not if they're immobile for a long time. Yes, please. I'm just going to raise the my young chest up between feeling cold because it's just experiences that you've actually been staying through. So it isn't that they're not mobile; it's just they're perfectly mobile. Mm -hmm. and it's not cold. And right. I understand that it seems practically to be the This is this gradual change in sensory function and the ability yeah. to interpret it. I, I would say it's a slightly, I mean, it seems to be slightly more than that. It's, it's, I mean, I know you mentioned cold, but it's five or six or something, but more, yeah. it's really. You think it's more, more primary than that? Yeah, it's early, I, I early would put it in C3. Okay. And Show of hands, is everybody feeling cold? Is cold. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So that's something that needs to be promoted. Okay. 
and also um, muscle pain or weakness seems to be happening where I would thought of stage three or four. Okay. Not not a severe problem, just like the cost of goals. Yep. So this is the stage that my husband's at, and and yet, so as before, I suppose there was things. Sorry, did you would you mind speaking <coughs> up? Sorry, um, my husband's at, at this stage, I would say, but can still sit up without support and laugh. He can't smile, but I can get him to laugh. Right. And those are the sparks that you know for anyone who's sort of you know early stages and this is awful of course it's all awful yep. but you cope with it just as you coped with the early stages yep. and my main goal in life I think is to make him laugh because it's <laughs> wonderful and it's the old love it's him you yep. know? but although he can't smile he can have a laughing fit okay. which is fantastic that's really helpful it's spoken a lot about written a lot about emotion I almost think that like hearing Emotion is almost a pure thing that isn't affected. At least that was my experience. We didn't get to stage seven. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. The people um, who are caring for these people must engage with all of those issues. We do not accept those are are inevitable. And I think I was led to believe that a lot of that stuff was inevitable and by a number of people, and those things aren't inevitable, mm -hmm. um, you know, things can be done yeah. um, about skin. Vegetables are not inevitable. You know, that's unacceptable. And um, nutrition, you've got to find a way of keeping these people at a good weight. Yeah. However you do it, you do it. Um, and, you know, once again, I was, I was told it was inevitable, but it was just because now they got reported to the, the higher beings and things are happening and things are better. Yeah. But I was told these things were inevitable. Sure. It was, so at, at this stage, you know, we, we've got to really get the carers to, to work hard at this yeah. stuff. Yeah. I think I think some of this is about trying to express risk rather than this will have, rather than inevitability. Yeah. So everyone absolutely this is not inevitable, but the risk the risk of something like bed sores is obviously much higher if someone is lying in bed yeah. in mobile the whole time relative to someone who's walking around. I agree. Done, I agree. They must be done. Absolutely. And if you're fogged off as saying you're inevitable, you shouldn't be sure. You know, you should get independent help to help you find out what they should be doing instead. So that's really yeah. important. And this is why it's really important that we have the input of people who've been through different stages of this process because um, we here, as you all know, tend to see people because of where we're based who are, who are still mobile, people who can still come to London. Um, and so we're naturally, unfortunately, biased towards seeing people in the mild and moderate stages. And we very we have not much experience of working with people at this stage because it's a different level of care, it's a different situation. Um, so it's really important that those of you who do have experience of looking after people who are in this sort of situation do contribute to this project. Thank you. Yes. Question: I haven't uh, heard or seen anything about music. Part of the music can play right. in, uh, in the person who survived and have been able to read or watch TV or any of the other functions that yep. they may have done during the life. Uh, the big part of the music, their ability to sing, remember the words of songs, but they can't remember much else at all. I haven't heard anything mentioned of that here today. Does anyone agree with me? Yeah. Yes, yes. 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 There's not much. <laughs> I, I have to say that in, the, in my experience, Gaynor is sort of somewhere between six and seven, and she has always been somebody who loved music and stuff, but she has no recall of, of, of songs or anything. She enjoys, she, I mean, she, she responds to music, but she can't really participate in it in terms of singing. I took uh, my wife to the, the, the film shop quite a few months ago now when Play Miss was. The film we had been to the live show several years ago. She was singing every song out loud, and I expected to be thrown out. Of <laughs> Fortunately, we weren't. <laughs> um, 
last couple of questions, I think, and then we'll probably have to let those who need to go go. I think this is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Thank you. I've heard before the arguments that, oh, I don't really want to know what's in store. Um, I really wish I had known this stuff a long time ago, because, even from a personal point of view, when you think things are terrible, it makes you appreciate the fact that they're not terrible. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to know that things are going to get a lot worse. Yeah. And it makes you treasure those moments much more. Even though you think, you know, it's terrible you have to help your wife go to the toilet. Yeah. Actually, there's still a lot of things that you are still having to go. And I think it's important for all carers to actually be aware, I'm not going to what's going on, uh, of all of these things. Um, and I, I really wish I'd had this earlier and not been, I have to say, fogged off with that, oh, it's different for everybody. This, 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 you know, that's, that's kind of not good enough. I'm not saying that comes from this. <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, but, okay, from the clinicians. I've got the caveats in as well. Oh, I will be. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Would it ever be possible to put alongside this the things that still do work yes. at those stages? Like, you might want to think about because they can't read using the radio more or yep. audio books or but the positives the music yes. the, the movement yes. if you're That's trying to get them coming. yeah you know to look at something you use your finger or you use whatever absolutely um, so, so i think in tricks of the training in, in my mind at least this was um, a sort of structure against which you can then help people to relate lots of other stuff either that we've already got completed or in draft about tips and advice. It gives you a kind of a framework to say this is the stage in which this might be helpful or you know, music way there will be something which is really enjoyable but there will be some people who by stage six or seven can't enjoy it in the way that they used to or whatever. You know, we've got those visual tips and strategies for example which are um, we would one of the newsletters and on the website but they're clearly helpful for people at the sort of stages one, two, three, four maybe, um, but not so much at this level. So we need to extend that kind of advice and, um, and, and tips and strategies, I think. Okay. That also goes on to extending that to things like a lasting power of attorney, yeah. which I failed to do for the last 11 months. And, that's, and it's just something that I'm perfectly confident to do, but under this special circumstance, yeah. I failed to do it. And I wonder if others have actually failed to, to create the lasting power of attorneys, uh, which are pretty important. I think it's so what do you mean failed? Well, <laughs> not I'm not actually doing it emotionally. I'm finding it very hard with, with, with my wife to, to sit down with her and just go through the, the essential requirement for that lasting power to be to be signed over. I, I, I have, but I was able to involve our daughters as well. Ah. I, I wouldn't have wanted to have done it on my own, so I appreciate what you mean. But having other families mm -hmm. make make it much easier. Do you have to be different is that my mum has gone to a psychologist, uh, and that has really helped her to then start mm -hmm. to talk about how she needs to deal with the emotions that she's having, having been diagnosed with it. And we've done some family sessions actually to talk about some of these things. And that, right. you know, using the, the it, once you've got a diagnosis, you can't get it before you've had a diagnosis. That's yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. need to use your diagnosis to then get the extra support. But Absolutely. locally, our members, local mental health team are pretty good. And, her, and because she's unusual, that's mm -hmm. kind of way, way just how we can help can I just say a big thank you to all of you? You've given me a lot of um, food for thought. Um, just to be completely clear, um, we've been recording this just so I didn't have to take notes, which I will use, if it's okay with you, for my own benefit to go back through and pick up on the many, many good ideas and suggestions that have been mentioned today. And as I say, I'll then try and update this, um, improve it a bit, pass it around to other colleagues here for their input, and then send out to you again, if that's okay. And try and try and think of a way of getting, a sort of suggesting a kind of, um, relatively easy but kind of structured way to give feedback. Because um, I'm aware a lot of you don't have much time given the other pressures um, on your uh, and obligations that you have at the moment. So big thank you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, Jill, we've been very sorry to miss uh, you all. We'll be looking forward.
forward to seeing you at future meetings. And I'm sure there are other questions I'm happy to stay around for a while, as I'm sure the others are. Um, but if you do have any questions, either for me or for Jill, that you don't want to ask today, if you've got to go, please always do feel free to phone or email us. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.